Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending today's webinar on optimizing your facility's sanitation program to protect your plants and staff, which is sponsored by Virox Technologies, the manufacturers of shield disinfectants. My name's Siobhan, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Today's speaker is Troy Henderson. He's an industry consultant with more than five years of experience in infection prevention and control. He focuses specifically in the cannabis industry. Troy specializes in streamlining and designing biosecurity programs for cannabis producers. So just a few technical notes before we begin. We'll follow the presentation with a Q&A session at the end. So please submit your questions on the right-hand side in the question box, and we will answer them afterwards. Additionally, uh, this webinar is gonna be recorded, so you can view it online uh, on demand on the Grow Opportunity website. Um, and also you can share it with your teams for future reference as well. So I will pass the mic over to Troy, take it away. Thank you, Siobhan, and thank you to Grow Opportunity for, for hosting us and for all the attendees. So before we get into the thick of it, I just wanted to give a quick background on Virox Technologies, which is the company I work for and the maker of Shield Disinfectants. So um, we were established in 1998. You might have actually heard us recently on the news with some of our efforts uh, combating the coronavirus uh, and some of the help the Ontario government is working with us to get our products out there. Um, but we're, we're really focused on research and development and we have a patented formula called accelerated hydrogen peroxide that uh, is really the base behind all of our products. Um, and we, we're in a bunch of different industries. So what we've done, which is a little bit different from a, a general disinfectant manufacturer is we design, develop, patent, and register products for specific industries. So we have products for just for hospitals, for cannabis facilities, for vet clinics, dentists, you name it. We really like to understand what the industry needs and develop products for that. So the main driver behind our, our products is accelerated hydrogen peroxide. So it's really, it's a synergistic blend of accelerated hydrogen peroxide being the active ingredient with a bunch of other safe ingredients that, you know, when combined, it really uh, increases the efficacy of the hydrogen peroxide as well as being very safe to use uh, and easy to use. Um, and some of the benefits of the product um, are were given by our CEO at a recent um, media post by the New York Times. We have a video here of him speaking of what is so great about accelerated hydrogen peroxide and really what is a challenge when you're ma manufacturing a disinfectant. The bugs are mutating but the chemicals stay the same. So it's not terribly difficult to disinfect a surface. It's difficult to disinfect a surface without hurting the surface or the person doing it and the environment most used. So that's really the Coles Notes version of why it is difficult to create a disinfectant. Um, it's not, it, it, as Brandy said there, it is easy to create something that can kill uh, a pathogen, but you have to be careful of, you know, you don't want to harm the user. Uh, you know, maybe the stainless steel table you're trying to clean or the environment at disposal. So why is sanitation important? And I think everyone has a good idea of this. Uh, you know, it is a regulatory aspect. You know, you have to ensure the cleanliness of your premises and equipment. But, you know, with the ongoing coronavirus, there is some, uh, you know, it is of a higher need. So you want to prevent outbreaks, not only for plants, uh, but also for people, uh, you know, cannabis being an essential business, you, you know, you still have your your employees working there sometimes uh, in close quarters. So, uh, you know, you want to do everything you can to protect them, but also, you know, you have things like powdery mildew outbreaks, which, you know, your sanitation program can uh, be a huge barrier in, in, to reduce the risk of that. So your product is one thing, but when you're looking at your sanitation program in general, there's, there's many different aspects you want to consider. So this is a really helpful infograph uh, that kind of shows you the seven steps that you want to look at or to take when you're designing your program. And we'll go through these throughout the presentation. So the first one is responsibilities. And it is really important that not only the person doing the job knows that they're responsible, but everyone else knows who is responsible for doing that job. And we look at some of the implications when the responsibilities maybe aren't clear. So there's one example we have in a hospital where um, you know, there's the patient rooms and the patient bathrooms and there was an outbreak of C. diff and they couldn't really understand where it was coming from. And when they determined the result and, you know, the cause of the whole outbreak, it was because the responsibility wasn't clear uh, in the facility. So nurses 
didn't think that the patient bathrooms were had to be cleaned by them because it was part of the janitorial staff and the janitorial staff were saying well you know nurses it's part of the patient's uh, bathroom and equipment it's your job so in the end it wasn't getting cleaned and it caused a pretty large outbreak so you can see how it is important to know who is responsible uh, to get the job done so defining your levels of risk a lot of the times we see it um, you know kind of let's say pre-coronavirus is gpp versus non-gpp so you know are you cultivating are you processing cannabis in this room it's going to be a high risk area and you're going to want to do everything you can to protect your product and your people in those areas then you have some of your lower risk areas you know maybe your your staff offices uh kitchen uh that where you still want to you know keep a keep it clean and and remove kind of all those pathogens but maybe it's not as serious as inside your facility however with the ongoing coronavirus uh, outbreak we have seen um you know a lot higher um sanitation methods and disinfecting throughout the entire facility so we have a, a couple pictures here and it just when you're looking at what where you want to clean and disinfect there's a lot of different variables that can go into to when you want to design your protocols for example so you know some of these pictures are just kind of general but if you look at you know the top right the growing in soil that's going to be you know when you're cleaning and disinfecting after that there's going to be a lot of soil to remove so you want maybe to have a strong cleaner whereas you know the picture on the top left uh top left sorry is your, your cloning room there might not be as much soil there so maybe you don't need as strong as a cleaner when you move throughout the process to your your processing maybe you're extracting uh, that's where you know things do get a lot more dirty you get the that sticky resin that can be tough to to remove prior to your disinfecting and then you know even there's some more applications here so a lot a lot of the questions we get are around you know trimming machines which can take quite a long time to clean and disinfect and those resins do stick on pretty tough uh, you know we, we see foot baths you know bottom right you can see small handheld trimmers so it's and it can be quite complex when you're creating your sanitation program and one of the things this is some of the things you want to consider so are you trying to remove that sticky resin or is it just soil or maybe organic matter like some dead leaves that were left behind and then the other thing you want to consider is what are you actually trying to kill so are you trying to kill or trying to remove bacteria viruses fungi and molds uh, which would fall under a disinfecting category and we'll get into that later or is it maybe like an insect that's uh, causing an outbreak in your facility so that's you know maybe spider mites or aphids where you'd want to use a pesticide for that or some kind of uh, pest control product um, and then you want to consider how is the pathogen or the outbreak spreading so you know some of the common ones air water and soil but vectors are the most common uh, humans being the the largest source for contamination and spread of um, transmission throughout your facility so this is a, a really great breakdown of kind of how, what to look for when you're selecting your product so there's kind of we'll kind of bucket it in here to three different categories so the first one your degreaser and your detergents which a lot of the times kind of falls under the umbrella of a cleaner so these are not regulated by health canada we could uh, you know, right now I could put water in a bottle, put a label on it, and I could start selling that, saying that it, it'll clean. Um, you know, Health Canada isn't going to stop me. The only thing I'd have to uh, be careful of, obviously, is the toxicity. Um, and for for you and, and the cannabis, the only regulation around cleaning is that there's no residual contamination that's going to affect your your cannabis or your end product in any way. So cleaners, again, they, they'd be good maybe prior to disinfecting. Maybe you're using isopropyl, and you want to uh, clean a trimming machine. So you're going to have to use a pre-cleaner uh, to a pre-clean step. So I probably with a degreaser to remove that prior to disinfecting. So then you have your disinfectants, which under that will be disinfectants and sanitizers. So those are all regulated by Health Canada quite heavily and under the food uh, FDA, and they will carry DIN numbers. So if you're if you have a product in your facility or you're looking for a product to to bring in your facility for your disinfection. You want to make sure that it does have a DIN number. That means that Health Canada has reviewed all the data that has been generated in terms of toxicity, um, what it can eradicate and what it cannot, and the use that's recommended. And they say, yeah, this is good, makes sense, and here's your, your DIN number. So always make sure you look for that and follow the, the label uh, language on there. And lastly, we have pesticides, which... Um, it's actually not managed by, it's under Health Canada, but it's the, the Pest Management Regulatory Agency or the PMRA. Um, and those products will carry a PCP. So these 
our uh, our pesticides, maybe um, to either to kill powdery mildew or an insect in your facility. So a little bit different use you can see there as well. So looking at disinfectants, the way that you would be able to get a claim on your label is uh, really based on this hierarchy of susceptibility, and this is followed both by the EPA and Health Canada. So at the top of the pyramid is the toughest to kill um, pathogens on um, that we know of, and the bottom is the easiest kill. And they're they're grouped into their families. So for example, envelope viruses uh, would be the easiest to kill. So what, what when you're looking for a product, you want to make sure it can kill the toughest pathogen that you expect to see in your facility. So for cannabis, um, you know, non-envelope viruses is probably a good place to to stop. You know, fungi is, is a common one, but you can go a step above that. It's great. And then even, you know, mycobacteria, it won't hurt as well. So uh, the Shield product does have all the way to mycobacteria, but you do want to make sure again, that there is some kind of claim against your fungi, bacteria and viruses when you're choosing that product. So I've thrown around a couple of terms, sanitizing and disinfecting. Um, and a lot of these, a lot of times these terms kind of fall under the umbrella of sanitizing or sanit sanitation, but they're, they are different. So when you're looking at sanitizing, it's going to reduce the level of microorganisms present, but it's not, not at a very high level. So it's a three log reduction against, um, you know, vegetative bacteria and then um, a five log against for, for food contact, but that's not going to be a concern for cannabis. So th these are really good. This is a great for uh, some of the low risk areas for, of your facility, but if this is a high risk area facility where you're doing cultivation, uh, this wouldn't really be enough and you'd be fighting an uphill battle every day. And then you're going to look at disinfecting, which is what is what we recommend for your, all of your high risk areas in your facility. And it is a, a five log reduction against vegetative bacteria, fungi and viruses. So unlike uh, sanitizing, you actually have claims against viruses and fungi here. Um, de depending on the product, it may or may not kill envelope viruses, which are the tougher of the the two kind of families of viruses there. Um, and this is really appropriate for those high risk areas. So if maybe you have a, a cultivation room that you're trying to clean after a harvest, you wanna pick a disinfectant product that is um, has efficacy against viruses, bacteria, and fungi. So kind of one of the, the elephants in the room is, you know, is my disinfectant effective against SARS-CoV-2? We get a lot of questions on that. So there's really, there's two things you wanna look for. We do know it is somewhat an easy pathogen to kill, but that doesn't mean that anything will be able to kill it. So the way Health Canada does that is there's two claims you wanna look for on your label. Some will have both, some might only have one. So there's the broad spectrum virucidal claim, and there's a little snippet there from an actual product label, which says this product is virucidal in three minutes. Here's what it's against. Um, knowing that you have a pretty good idea that it will deactivate the product. The, really the, the golden standard for this is actually the emerging pathogens claim though, which um, this is an example from uh, a product that when the polio virus, uh, sorry, when the H1N1 pandemic was um, was around. And this, basically what what's here is that the product has proven effectiveness against polio virus, which is one of the toughest viruses to eradicate. And then it basically, it, it'll say, you know, we assume that it'll kill anything under that in that hierarchy. So. You want to make you want to look for that on your products. So this is actually a, a graphic by the CDC of what to look for in an ideal disinfectant. We're going to be going through all this again as well. But you know, if if you're a facilities manager QA and you want to do a comparison against two products, this is um, you know these are the metrics to compare against. So one of the ones there was faster. So. Um, we're talking about fast, we're really, we're talking about contact time. And contact time is the time the disinfectant needs to stay wet on the surface in order to ensure efficacy. So a lot of the times, especially uh, consumers, is they have this uh, thought that, you know, let's say isopropyl, you can wipe that and walk away, it's gonna kill everything. That's not actually true. If you were to, you have a can of Lysol around you or um, some kind of bleach, if you read the small print, it will talk to the contact time, the amount of time it needs to stay wet, the surface. So um, for, for isopropyl, that time can vary between about five and 10 minutes. And as we know, it, it'll dry in about 30 seconds. So uh, you wanna make sure that you're picking a product that 
the contact time can be reached within one application if possible. And if you don't reach that contact time, you're, you're not being compliant with the label and there's no guarantee that if you were trying to kill that fungi, you might you probably did not kill it if you didn't reach the contact time. So that can open you up to some risk. So our products, this is an example from um, one of our, our US products. It was the only technology where the dry time exceeded the contact time, which means in one application, uh, you've hit that contact time, you're good to walk away and the area is being cleaned and disinfected. So here's a quick video of looking at contact time between two different products, which we've un we haven't named. Okay, sorry about that. So another another key metric to look at uh, when you're choosing your product is one step versus two step. So a one step disinfectant will not require a pre-cleaning step unless the surface is heavily soiled and will clean and disinfect at the same time. So uh, Shield, for example, the disinfecting product manufactured by Virox, it is actually a one step product. So uh, assuming there's not you know a heap of soil or uh, organic matter on the surface you know one application of the product will both clean and disinfect uh, the surface and that'll cut out a lot of time compared to a two-step product where you will always need to pre-clean prior to your disinfecting so uh, if you could imagine the the process for that um, for your um, your isopropyl for example you would have to use a cleaner let that dry or rinse it and then apply that disinfectant which adds a couple steps into your your process where as with a one-step product you clean disinfect and you can walk away then that surface is ready to go there's more things to consider just with the the kind of the performance of the product but also the safety aspects is is really important you know especially with a lot of these facilities uh working with um reduced uh workforce you know you want to make sure your workforce that's there is healthy and safe um, so this is uh, again by the CDC looking at healthcare workers and you know some of the um, the issues you can run into if you either use a product incorrectly or maybe you don't have the correct personal protective equipment and you know a lot, a lot of these are commonly are you know your neurological yeah uh, your skin damage eye damage and respiratory is another large one especially with IPA um, and we've seen like some of the uh, the WSPS and some of the other workplace safety organizations in Ontario are really cracking down on uh, you know, inappropriate or excessive use of IPA without uh, PPE required. So that's kind of a um, good segue to this where you know, a lot of facilities that we, we see, they might be, let's, I just always kind of pick isopropyl alcohol because it's the most common, commonly used, is they might have, a, they, they know that it, it's not the best product and maybe that it is toxic to their employees and they you just keep adding those PPE barriers uh, hoping that the pro the problem will go away instead of really tackling the the base of the problem, which is the product. So instead of you know kind of working back, you can work backwards to that and maybe you know look at a whole new protocol or a whole new product to eliminate the need for all that PPE, especially right now while it's in a super high demand, and we we'd like to give as much as that as we can to our frontline workers. So another another one of those um, metrics when you're looking at to compare different, the two different disinfectants is the simplicity of use. So here's an example of a one-step product where, um, or sorry, a two-step product where you're going to remove that visible soil. Um, you know whether that be with a, a cleaner or even with an you know, example a one-step product where you do that all at once. Uh, next, so then you know uh, once you've done that, you can apply your disinfectant, and then if your contact time has been met. You can allow it to air dry, or in some cases, you're going to want to rinse to um, reduce the risk of any of those residues um, contaminating your end product. So that's where you want to look at, again, the, the type of soils and where that equipment or surface is going to end up. But really, it, it can be this simple in most cases. 
So training is another really important part of your sanitation program. Um, you always want to make sure that, especially especially if you're changing to, for example, if you're switching, um, you know, maybe you can't find the product you're looking for right now, so you have to switch to another one. You want to make sure, A, that everyone in the facility using the product knows why you're switching and what to expect. So maybe the new product you've switched to um, leaves a scent that the other product didn't. So, you know, let them know what to expect before they run into that. Maybe they might think it's a toxic scent. Hopefully it's not. Um, and then, of course, you know, when you're when you do this training as well, it's always important to follow up maybe, you know, yearly, uh, twice year training, because a lot of the times your employees might see things that when they're doing some of these jobs that you might not have known were maybe an issue. So maybe they're saying, yeah, you know, my uh, my back really hurts from having to use this microfiber mop all day. So it really goes both ways. They can give you a lot of information as well on what's working, what's not, maybe what they don't like doing. And then you can work with them to make sure that your program is optimized and it works for everyone. And we we have Virox really do take training seriously. We like to uh, you know train all of our customers, make sure that they're happy using the product. And uh, it's really a big part of your program that oftentimes does get unlocked. Accessibility is another really important one. So you know, for example, if, if someone were to ask you to go clean uh, a grill room and you had a bottle of bleach, so you're going to have to, or even if you had isopropyl in a uh, fire safety cabinet, you know, you're going to have to go there, you're going to have to uh, get a key maybe, or ask your supervisor to open that cabinet. Um, then you're going to have to hand mix the product, bring it in there. It, it just, it's a lot, it's what makes the whole task a lot tougher, where if that product is accessible, whether that be um, you know, maybe in bottles throughout your room and of course the, with the proper workplace label or maybe there's like dilution systems throughout your facility so that if you do need to clean, you can go with a bucket, fill it up, um, bring it around. That just makes the overall job a lot easier and actually um, it leads to increased compliance throughout your whole program. Um, anything you can do to, to make the job obviously like less uh, time, less time and less labor, but also for the people doing the job. It just takes the, those extra steps that aren't too fun and you know less excuses too if the job doesn't get done. Compliance and validation is another one that we've been working quite a lot on with a lot of customers recently. Um, so there's a lot of ways once you kind of went through your entire program and you've done your clean of your room, how do you make sure, how do you know that it's actually been clean disinfected properly? So most commonly we see ATP testing, which I think is really great for kind of that clean, quick and dirty method of seeing how, how the job was done. Um, there's some really great software out there as well where you can um, you can uh, tag, let's say, let's say you did a swab in grow room one on this day, and it and you know it'll show you all your grow room one swabs on like on a graph. And you can see kind of where that data is trending, uh, maybe the second Tuesday of every month. For some reason that number is really high so you can go in and find out you know what's causing that is a step being missed to the program um, maybe there's just more soil being generated uh, on that week compared to another week but it can help you get to the bottom of the, the issue and you know coupling that with um, micro testing as well so again maybe you keep getting a high number somewhere and you don't know what's causing it you can take a micro swab and send it to a lab and they can say hey it's it's uh, you know aspergillus or whatever it is and really help you dial down on what's causing it. There are other methods as well. So here, um, the, the other picture there is uh, a UV. Um, this is more of a visual, and we don't really see this too much in cannabis, but there are there are options out there. Uh, and then lastly, another one that you'll see with some disinfectant uh, chemistries is test strips. So it would work similar to your hot tub test strip, where you dip the test strip in, wait a certain amount of time, and if that color change matches what's on the label you know that your your disinfectant is at the right uh concentration it has been diluted correctly or it is still effective maybe even using it for a couple of days and we've had really great feedback with this when um you know creating a program for this and showing health canada that you are on top of it so um you know a lot of our customers have dilution systems and they can create a logbook where uh weekly they'll test the dilution system with that uh test strip write the information down and when Health Canada comes in there, they can show them, hey, here's what we use. Um, we get it from this station, which has been um, you know, validated by the 
manufacturer. And then we also validate as well with our test strips weekly. And here's the logbook we haven't failed once. Uh, and you know, Health Canada really does appreciate that. Pretty much any data you can give them, um, uh, they're really happy to see. And then you know, maybe one day it it'll fail for whatever reason. Maybe there's a, a faulty tip in the dilution system, or someone hand mixed it wrong. You know, something's not right, and you shouldn't be using that uh, disinfectant. Whereas if you weren't monitoring it, um, you know, maybe you would have used that disinfectant if it was too weak. You might have you know opened yourself up to some risk of an outbreak. So yeah, you know your compliance and, and monitoring is definitely an important part like that again does get overlooked. But once you get that program in place, uh, it's really easy to stay on top of, and it can show you some really great data about what's going on um, in your in your sanitation biosecurity program in general. So that's that's pretty much it for the information um, that we're going to be sharing today. We do have I kind of mentioned throughout the presentation. So Virox, we do have a product called Shield, which we have designed, patented, and registered with Health Canada specific for the cannabis industry. Um, you know, it, it really, it is really great. So, it, so it's a one-step product, um, the five to three minute contact time. So if we go back um, to, sorry, to this, um, Sorry, my computer is frozen. If you go back to the CDC um, slide here, we can we can go through and look at where Shield where Shield stands on there. My computer is not working the way I'd like it to right now. Um, here we go. So when you look at Shield, it is broad spectrum against bacteria, viruses, and fungi, and it actually goes all the way to uh, mycobacteria. So kind of a step above. Um, when you look at the fast acting, it is a three to five minute contact time for disinfecting and 30 seconds for sanitizing. So with a concentrate, for example, maybe you have some areas in your facility where uh, are, you would deem as high risk and you can use the concentrate there. And the same product diluted um, a little bit of a higher dilution, you can use to sanitize other areas of your facility. So that one product is really versatile and can be used just about throughout your whole facility. Um, when you're looking at environmental factors, that's kind of your one, one step and two step. And Shield is a one-step product, so it's not affected by those environmental factors, and it will clean and disinfect in one step. Shield is also it's non-toxic, so once it's diluted or you're using the ready-to-use wipes or liquid, there's actually no PPE required whatsoever. Um, there's no scent as well, so I you know a lot of the times, um, we, let's say IPA or bleach, you you can really smell that. You know when a room has been cleaned or disinfected with that. So Shield has no scent, which uh, you know, it really does help, especially when you're using that every day. Uh, when you look at compatibility, Shield is, is compatible with just about every metal and plastic out there. Um, and that, you know, we see a lot of metals, especially stainless steel in cannabis facilities. When you look at chlorine-based products such as bleach, um, your stainless steel will corrode very fast. And we do see that often. So yeah, you do want to make sure that the products you're using will you know, affect any of the equipment in your facility, especially some of the expensive stuff. Um, Shield is also very soluble. So if you wanted to, let's say, run it through your lines to clean your irrigation lines, you can then follow it up with a water flush. And then you can actually use those test strips to see if there's any hydrogen peroxide left in the water lines as well. The stability of Shield is a, one of actually the, a great factor of it as well. So uh, in, the, in the bottle, it's about two years. Um, a shelf life and then once diluted it's it's 30 days uh for use and that's really high if you look at other products they can be you know one day to, to 10 days and 10 days would be pretty high um so you don't you're not going to be throwing out a lot of the product once you dilute it you can have your bottles around your facility with a proper workplace label and you know it's, it's going to last 30 days so i hope uh we you, you could use the one liter bottle within that time uh, and then, as I mentioned before, Shield is also a cleaner and a disinfectant. So, you know, maybe you don't always need to disinfect. Uh, maybe you're just trying to quickly clean a spill in your lunchroom. Uh, Shield will also be effective at that. And it is really effective at removing resins. We've done a lot of work with uh, Mobius and some of the other trimming manufacturers, kind of defining the best protocol and uh, to remove the resin and disinfect the machines. And uh, we have some great great protocols that we can share on if you're having any issues with 
cleaning some of those trimming machines or any really any of your processing machines, the resin is really similar. Um, you know, the easiest, the two steps that we always share, and it doesn't really matter which product you're using for that, is clean it as soon as you're you're done. Um, you don't you don't want to wait overnight, or even I've seen some facilities wait a week before they they clean that machine, and that just makes the job a lot tougher. Um, again, to make your life easier as well, we we'd recommend using hot water when possible. That will really help remove those resins. Not always possible, but um, those are two two key. Um, steps that if you can we would recommend for sure uh, so environmentally friendly as well you know you don't want to be hurting the environment a lot of these facilities as well um, you know you might be in some remote areas maybe on a green belt you don't want to be dumping any toxic chemicals into the environment so shield is readily biodegradable um, and we are um, and the, the the wipes itself are the only things that aren't going to be biodegrade biodegradable so uh, the liquid you could dump down the drain it's fine but the wipes we'd well, have to actually throw out but other than that the product is great um it, it's it's safe to use there'd be no smell and um yeah our toxicity uh, data is is very good um so that that's pretty much it for, from us um I, this uh, this will be available as well but i think we might have some questions um from siobhan now yeah thanks so much troy um, so let's move on to the Q&A question. So there's still time to submit your questions. Just use the question box on the screen. Uh, we've already had a lot of great ones, so we'll try to get back to as many of you as possible. So one of the first questions we have, um, what are the common mistakes you see, Troy, in facilities that are you know, a relatively easy fix? I'd say the number one would be um, using one mop or bucket or just a general application uh, throughout your entire facility. So um, for example, let's say you have four grow rooms and one mop and you're using that mop within all of your grow rooms, that's opening you up to a lot of risk. So for example, if one of those rooms were to have a contamination, um, maybe that's powdery mildew, you wanna make sure that everything in that room is staying in that room and you don't want that powdery mildew to leave and go to another room. So having designated equipment for each of your areas or rooms or maybe even um, applications is, is really beneficial and it goes a long way to stopping that infection before or the outbreak before it spreads even further. Perfect. Um, another question we received, so what are common kind of disinfectant products or actives that you're seeing and, you know, are they being used correctly or um, are they in compliance when used by staff? Yeah, so I think I've mentioned a lot. I, I, isopropyl alcohol is the number one product that I see. I've uh, been in about 100 to 120 facilities the last six to eight months, and probably all of those have had isopropyl in, in one way or another in their pro program or protocol. Um, I, I see it used incorrectly, both in terms of not following that contact time of 10 minutes. So um, really, if, if you did want to achieve disinfection using isopropyl, you'd have to sit there and apply the product for about 10 minutes. Um, so that most of the time doesn't get done. It does sometimes. It's a lot of extra work. Um, but a lot of the times as well, it's the pre-clean step that gets miss, uh, missed. So if you do not pre-clean before you apply the isopropyl or even a chlorine-based product, um, the environmental um, factors like your soils, your resins, they will impact the efficacy of the product and it's not going to do what it's intended to do, for example, kill that bacteria or the powdery mildew. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, another question we got, so what is going to be the best method to clean uh, resin off of surfaces or equipment? Yeah, so uh, besides the other two points I mentioned, which were warm water and clean it as, as soon as you can, don't let it kind of sit there. Um, when possible, we see soaking uh, as a really great application. Um, with Shield, for example, we have a lot of our customers, maybe they're using a twister, the, the tumbler, which can be really tough to clean. Um, after about a 10 minute soak in that, um, you can you can remove that resin, you know, even with your finger. It's um, so that, you know, sometimes it takes takes a little bit longer, um, but, you know, you can let it sit there for 10 minutes, go do something else, come back, and then it'll be your job's a lot easier. Perfect. Um, besides that, too, I think it's a combination, you know, you can't soak everything. Um, you're gonna have, you might have to try a couple different methods. For if you're if you're using Shield, we do know the wipes are great for 
um, some of the areas of the machine that you can't remove. But if you can remove any parts, soak it in hot water. Even if you're not using shield, soak it in hot water before you apply your cleaner. That will go a long way. Great. Uh, another question we received was, so specifically with shield, um, can I test the concentration of the active ingredient, for example, using a test strip or another method? You can, for sure. So, yeah, so the, the concentrate for shield, it, come, it comes in 7%. Uh, you would then dilute it if you want to disinfect at 1 to 40. Um, so our test strip will will tell you if you, dip, if you were to dip it in there. Um, it, about 35 to 40 seconds, I think, you'd see a color change, and that would tell you it's 1 to 40. That same test strip you can use to validate that the, if you were to dilute it at the 1 to 128. Um, just a longer time. I think it's about uh, 120 seconds. Nice. Perfect. Um, another question we received was if there's any kind of potential um, like buildup on the surface, you know, are you, is there a concern about, um, I guess, antimicrobial uh, resistance over time? And then is there a reason to be rotating disinfectants? Yeah, we get that question a lot, actually. Um, I don't, I don't think that there's any reason to be rotating disinfectants that adds a lot of complexity to your program and um, it, it really is unnecessary. So there are there are some products that will uh, contribute to uh, microbial resistance. So when you're looking at quads, for example, there's a lot of data to show that they leave a, a film that has a small amount of their active ingredient. And since it's a very small amount, the bacteria will say, for example, they can look at, they can see that active ingredient and start developing a resistant to it. Uh, resistance to it sorry so it is out there with some technologies you know we're we we're very confident that the shield product as well as the hp technology uh does not contribute to any microbial resistance our products are used in you know upwards of 80 percent of hospitals in north america and uh that's never been reported in about 15 years of use perfect um we also have a question, are regular soaps efficient enough for cleaning, for example, with pots um, between uses if you're using substrates like cocoa? Um, I would say no. Um, you know, if you, if you think about it too, if, so you're reusing that pot, that's pretty much your lifeline. Like if that pot isn't properly disinfected between uses, that's a lot of risk there. And if you're only using, you know, what's this, for example, maybe you're using a, a bucket with soap and water and you're putting um, a microfiber in that, cleaning your um, your pot and going to the next one. Um, you, if you don't, you could actually be spreading a, an out, uh, a pathogen or creating an outbreak from that, that cleaning product right, um, right there. So we would always recommend to disinfect. Um, I'd be curious to understand if, if you can maybe a follow up question if that's possible, um, why, why you were choosing to just use a cleaner is there a reason you didn't want to use a disinfectant maybe that's um you know the integrity of the um the pot or whatnot but um that'd be something i'd like to understand a little bit more too to answer that question okay great um we've gotten a few questions now in regards to the applicate like the preferred applications for different formats so maybe we'll start at you know the wipes and then uh, provide an overview of when and how you'd be using the ready to use versus the concentrate um, there's some questions in regards to equipment and again, just those ideal areas for each format. Sure. So, well, I can just kind of maybe do a, a breakdown of all the formats then. Um, so I think our most popular one or definitely a facility favorite would be the wipes. Um, they're, they're really convenient. We have that kind of paired with wall brackets. So at an entrance to your room, you can have a wall bracket on the wall with the wipes, the wipe canister sitting in that bracket. Uh, they're really great for your handheld trimmers, um, you would need to rinse after, but there it's just a quick wipe and it will remove all that resin from the, the trimmer uh, very effectively. They're good for your tabletops, your stainless steel tables, for example, or even uh, if you're growing on like a, like a hydroponic table, for example, maybe there's some nutrient buildup somewhere, you can use those wipes to kind of quickly clean under, um, under the plants without uh, you know, maybe you don't, you don't want to be spraying around them. So it's really great. You don't aerosolize any product when you're using the wipes. Um, as well, you know, more recently, all your, do your, your high touch surfaces. So your door handles, your washroom sinks, all that. The wipes are great for there. You can use a wipe and, you know, you can get a bunch of high touch surfaces. 
and you're you're reducing that spread of an outbreak. Um, so the, yeah, the wipes are really versatile. We see them used everywhere. Um, the ready to use liquid is really great for maybe you have uh, some areas in your facility, you don't want a lot of people going in and out. So you don't want people to have to maybe go to a dilution system and get some product and bring it in there where you can just have a case of one liter bottles that are ready to go in there. Um, you know, a lot of the times as well, the so a lot of the micros that like the, the ready to use liquid. Um, if you have an issue with your water supply, so maybe um, you're shipping water in from somewhere else, uh, we've seen that. And you know, you, you don't wanna waste any of your precious water on diluting, the ready to use is great for that as well. Um, but the concentrate is, is really what we see in majority of our facilities, especially the larger ones. Um, so we have a great kind of system program where we have a dilution system, which I've mentioned before, which uh, we can set up to dilute at one to 40, one to 128, uh, maybe just one to 40, just one to 128, kind of whatever you want, it's, it, it's, it works with you. And um, it really takes all the risk away from hand diluting. So A, you're, you're never gonna be actually touching the concentrated product, which uh, you never you never wanna do. Shield concentrate isn't um, you know more toxic than anything else. So you just would need gloves and um, eye protection, but it's still a risk. You don't wanna be touching that con uh, concentrate. And then you know while using that system, you're saving a lot of time by it diluting for you. And you can validate that it has been diluted correctly. So um, that's a, a, a really great part of the overall program that we, we can offer. Um, the concentrate, it starts at a four liter uh, jug, which is pretty small, usually about 10,000 square feet would start using those. Uh, it goes all the way up to 200 uh, liter drums. So uh, really versatile for any facility and it's it's scalable as well. You could have that dilution system with a four liter. Maybe you have, you double your facility size, you can then have that exact same dilution system and then you're just ordering a 20 liter pail instead. Um, and that's kind of the beauty of it as well is we we're gonna, we can grow with you and if you need uh, that larger format or another dilution system, it's super easy to set up. Uh, so then the application of you know the concentrate and ready to use, that's it really depends on the facility and that's something we spend a lot of time on. We like to, you know, if a facility out there is interested, they wanna use it, maybe they don't quite understand how it can be used. We really like to go to the facility look look take a look around see what they're doing now and then we can come back with recommended protocols uh we can help with sops even employee training as i mentioned a lot of the times though we will recommend foaming um especially if you're a greenhouse it really is great uh indoor it can get a little bit tricky with your room design if there's lighting uh drains whatnot but foaming is great because it sticks to the wall the, the ceiling you can see where you've actually hit uh, and then it's not going to trickle down like a liquid would. So you're going to, it's actually going to stick to the wall. Um, and we have some foaming guns as well with our distributor that can shoot, you know, 20, 30 feet at once. So you can clean the 20,000 um, square feet room very quickly and it, it'll cut your time and labor down a lot. Perfect. Thank you, Troy. Yeah, there was also some more application questions. Um, but as you mentioned, there's a lot of uh, equipment that we offer for foaming or spraying. Um, there was also a question just if they don't want to be doing any type of foaming or spraying, what are your other methods, um, you know, kind of like a microfiber mopping system or other items as well? Sure, yeah, so um, as I mentioned, a lot of times with indoors, foaming is not the, 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 um, not the optimum protocol. So uh, we have a couple different um, protocols for that. So you can kind of have your general mop and bucket not exactly ideal. Um, you know, those mops and buckets really tend to spread um, pathogens around your facility since you're kind of dunking that dirty mop back in there. But, um, you know, we have some, some, one thing we call kind of the squirt and go method. So um, almost imagine like a ketchup style type bottle. Um, if you're cleaning a floor, you could just squirt a little bit of that liquid onto the floor and then you just spread that around with the microfiber. Um, same thing with your walls, except you'd be, you can just spread it right onto your microfiber, spread it around the wall, and then just keep reapplying that microfiber. That way you're using, you're not, um, you're not compromising the integrity of the, the, the solution that you're using. No matter what solution you, you're using or what product you're using, if you're going to be dunking a dirty microfiber or mop in there, it's going to get contaminated and eventually it will be spreading a pathogen around your facility instead of removing it. 
And then in on top of that as well, um, you can soak with shield. So you could get a bunch of small implements or, you know, um, tools and soak with it. it. The beauty of it is it, it really is the one product that you can use throughout your entire facility and just about every application. The only two that we would never recommend would be directly on plants uh, as well as within your um, extraction lines. We don't want to do any of that, but um, really anywhere else in your facility, it can be used and we're here to help kind of optimizing those protocols. Great. Another application question was in relation specifically to, you know, foot baths or uh, shoe dip methods. So is there any kind of recommendations there uh, when it comes to product, but also best practice? Yeah, so we, we see um, a lot the foot, uh, foot baths, you know, pretty frequently in facilities. Um, the one issue that I have with them is 90% of the time that contact time isn't being reached. So, um, you know, if you remember like shield, for example, five minutes at the concentrate to um, to disinfect, you're not going to be standing in that foot bath for five minutes. Um, but I have seen some really great ideas from facilities for, for example, maybe that foot bath is under your sink. So when you're washing your hands for 30 seconds to a minute, you're also sitting in that foot bath for that long, which for shield that 30 seconds, that'll give you sanitizing, which is great. Um, but if you're trying to get away from foot baths, we have a lot of other options as well. So, you know, using the foot covers, for example, uh, maybe if your facility has dedicated footwear, every once you get in the facility, you're gonna be wearing that. If you're walking into a high risk room, so, you know, cultivation room one or your, your milling or your uh, processing room, put on a, a pair of shoe covers up over the, the, um, your dedicated footwear. That way, you know, you're not bringing anything out uh, from your facility into the the room and then when you leave you're going to have a sticky mat outside the room you, you walk on that take your shoe covers off uh, and it's good to go so i can i would usually recommend those if for a facility that has nothing in place um, a lot of the times to the the foot baths like they'll leave a trail of, of liquid which can you know it can be slippery and you can don't want anyone to fall um, but they you know some they are good they are great too and a lot of facilities use them so it really depends um, on your preference there. Siobhan, are you still there? Oh, hi. Yeah, another question we had was uh, when it comes to best practices in grow rooms, if there's plants in the area, um, should they be concerned if there's any kind of um, contamination on the leaves or roots or what are your kind of recommended options in grow room areas? Yeah, so that'll depend if um, if you're going to be growing by lot or your perpetual harvest. So if, it, if let's say you're a greenhouse where it's perpetual harvest, that can be a little bit more challenging. Um, you know, you don't want to be aerosolizing. Um, at all if there's plants in the room because that can open you up to some risk of accidentally applying it directly to the plant. Uh, we've seen uh, you know, some facilities, they might harvest, let's say half their greenhouse and they'll put like uh, a tarp up so that they're, they're limiting the, the risk of uh, getting, hitting those plants. Um, with, with Shield, for example, too, you can, you can still clean a majority of their room without, with the plants in there. So as I mentioned, using those wipes, or even you know, getting a, thing, a concentrate and a uh, saturated microfiber to maybe clean the tables under the plants. You can still mop inside the room uh, while there's plants in there. Ceilings you might wanna stay away from just because uh, you know, it could drip back onto the plants and um, that would not be good. Um, but you know, in the end to shield, it's not going to actually, it's not, there's nothing in there toxic that's going to harm your plants. Like it, it, it happens and it has happened where it accidentally get a plant. It's more just you, you want to be uh, compliant to the regulations from Health Canada. So you want to ensure that any way that you're using the product, you're minimizing any risk of contaminating the plants or the, the end product. Great. Thank you. Um, so I'll just give it a few minutes. So that's kind of our list of current questions. So if there's any last minute you know inquiries you guys want to touch base with troy on please jump in now yeah i see a uh, a note here too from uh the organizers so if um if there's any other questions too that maybe you think of 
after the webinar. Um, I don't know if I can, if I write in the chat, if everyone will see, but we, we can share my email as well. It's, it's not in the presentation, but, um, and that way, if there's any other questions, you can reach out and I can help you answer them. Yeah, let's share uh, Troy's email right now. And we're getting a couple more questions. So Troy, once you're done with the email, let me know. Yeah, I think uh, I think it should be good. If I go to the first slide, I just typed it in. Yeah, I'm ready for the question. Okay, great. So um, as you were speaking to foaming, so what are some recommendations you had for users who haven't done any kind of foaming applications previously? I'd recommend trying it out for sure. Um, most of the facilities, so if um, kind of tough right now to because we're we're Ontario based. If you are Ontario based, you know we can we can come out to your facility with uh, a foamer and you can try it out. We have a couple of great videos of well of facilities who um, we've actually been able to go in and, and do that and uh, you know record it, share it. But I think just just giving it a try in a low in a low risk scenario. And here's my email as well under um, right here. But yeah, and you, again, you want to make sure all your plants are out. If you're using HPS lights or um, a little more sensitive, you want to be careful of those or any electrical outlets. But if you have, if your room is kind of the, the room inside a room design where you know, your outlets are closed, your your lighting is is sealed, um, I would definitely recommend trying foaming. You'll see it'll cut your your labor time down in half. It really does save a ton of time. And the, the great part about Shield too is your floors, walls, ceilings, you don't have to rinse. So you can walk into that room, spray the whole thing down. Uh, maybe, you know, last thing end of the day, you come back in the morning and that's ready to go. You can bring plants in there. Great, thank you. Uh, one just housekeeping question we got is about the recording being available. So it will be on demand on the Grow Opportunity website. So it will be hosted there. So you can share it with your team or use it as reference. Um, Another question we got that's actually really common is in regards to disposal. So they're asking if the solution can be disposed of safely in a septic tank. Uh, yeah, septic tanks is a little bit challenging. We would need a little bit more information on that just because like more, more so what else is, is being added into there. Uh, generally disposing of shield is, is much easier than any other product. Um, there's really, there's really no considerations with that. But when you're looking at septic, um, we, we, we need to know some more information before we could give a recommendation. So feel free to send me an email and we can uh, take the conversation on there. Perfect. Um, there's also a question, I guess it also kind of goes back to rotating disinfectants or using multiple chemistries. There's a question if it's safe to uh, interact with isopropyl or if there's any kind of counter indications. Well, isopropyl in general is, uh, but sorry, is the question about is shield safe to interact with isopropyl? Yes. Well, you're never supposed to mix two disinfectant technologies together. So I'll say that before anything, but uh, you know, we've, we've seen a lot where maybe uh, someone will apply shield on a table and then end of the day, they'll follow through with um, isopropyl. So in terms of application fall by application uh we haven't seen any issues there um i would not ever recommend to uh dilute or mix your isopropyl in any other product your shield anything together um having multiple products in your facility is is a risk as well you know there's, there's always gonna have a couple but reducing that down to the few as possible is makes it a lot easier so maybe i've been in the facilities where they'll have six different disinfectants and cleaners each of those will have different areas where you can use it, different dilution rates, different contact times. Um, so as you, if you can imagine, that'd be pretty confusing for your user. Uh, and then as well, there's a lot of risk of, you know, well, of course, improperly diluting, but also maybe thinking you're using one product and you're actually using another. Um, if you mix two of those products together, there are products out there like ammonia and um, chlorine products. If you were to mix those two, uh, it's a pretty deadly result. So kind of reducing the amount of products you have reduces a lot of that risk and complexity in your program. Perfect. Uh, so this will be one of the last questions. So it was just in regards to fogging applications. Can shield be used? But also um, what are your kind of recommendations in relation to fogging? Yeah, so that, that's, that's a pretty big question we get a lot of the times as well. 
Uh, our stance on it is, you know, with the program that we can help with and the, the right products and following that, it's you won't need to you won't need to fog. I mean, for example, one of our our partner facilities, uh, James E. Wagner, JWC. Um, so they've been using our product for probably about three years now, and they they don't use it in fogging, and they've never had to irradiate. So you know, it's fogging is is a great kind of extra step, if if you will, but it's really not necessary if you can um, if you can do the disinfecting clean properly. Uh, and one thing also to note about fogging is you, you still would have to pre-clean your entire surface or room before you fog. Uh, it's not going to magically remove the resin that was stuck on your table or the stickiness on the floor. So if you're going to be doing a pre-clean of your entire room and then fogging, um, you know you could really just skip the fogging step and do a pre-clean and disinfect to a shield. Uh, all at once, and you know, if you want to fog after that, that's you can, but um, you really don't need to. Perfect. So this will be our last question, and um, we've had a lot of great engagement today. So unfortunately, we can't get to all of them, but we'll try our best to get back to everyone. You can reach out to Troy directly. Um, again, his email and his contact information is there. We'll also arrange to send out a link as we saw some requests for the on-demand webinar footage to any of the attendees or registrants. So we'll work with Grow Opportunity to send out that link. Um, yeah, so Troy, kind of as a next step, like what would you uh, recommend for participants to do in regards to just kind of reviewing their sanitation program or how can they really look at enhancing their, their current practices? Well, I would definitely look at slide six, which is kind of the seven steps uh, when you're designing your program. Maybe you overlooked one of those. Uh, so always good to take a step back and just evaluate. Um, I would also use that CDC um, graphic to look at your own product and you know really read the label. The label, you can't lie. Like Health Canada, um, they've approved everything that's on that label. So um, you know that's the best place to look for information on the product. Uh, the SDS as well, um, you know, it's always great to look at that, uh, look at the toxicity, some of the the um, components to avoid. So some of them might say, hey, don't use this on stainless steel. Uh, that's probably going to be an issue in a cannabis facility. So, you know, I would always be kind of ongoing looking at that. But I think in the end, it's it's talk to the, the end users, the, the employees that are on the ground, uh, you know, cleaning the facility or whatnot. Ask them what works. What what's the one thing they don't like doing? The last thing they want to do, and that that'll be really great feedback. Um, you know, the the shield product and the facilities. A lot of the time, sure, it'll help save money and time, and uh, you know, it's great. But the real the real satisfaction comes from the people using it, where they're not inhaling those harsh fumes every day. It's much more effective at cleaning, and it cuts the time in half. So they're going to be the ones that might also have some great ideas for some. Uh, process optimization and working with them will go a long way. Great, thank you. So I just wanted to thank everyone for attending the Grow Opportunity webinar. We appreciate all of the questions that you've asked. I'd also like to thank our speaker Troy for participating. So thank you all. Yeah, thank you everyone.